Revelation chapter 6, the opening of the sixth seal. And I beheld, when he had opened the sixth seal, and, lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heavens departed as a scroll, when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens, and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Now some people read these verses about the sixth seal, and they immediately jump to the conclusion that this is an end-time prophecy without giving it any due consideration. If the sixth seal was an end-time event, it would mean there was a 1,700-year gap between the fifth and sixth seal. It would also mean that Jesus Christ returns before the seventh seal, all seven of the trumpets, all seven of the plagues or bowls of judgment, and the vast majority of revelation being unfulfilled. Let me start by saying, this is not an end-time prophecy. This is not something way out there in the future somewhere. This is actually in the past, and it foretells the downfall of the pagan Roman persecutions. This was a glorious time in church history when the heathen powers came tumbling down. Now the great earthquake, sun, moon, stars, are not literal. Just as we have discovered in previous studies, these are symbolic. Let's go back to the book of Genesis. Joseph had a dream that he shared with his family. And he dreamed yet another dream, and told it his brethren, and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee to the earth? Jacob Israel immediately connected the symbolism of the sun, moon, and stars as members of their entire family. He did not ooh and ah that the literal sun, moon, and stars bowed to him. He knew it was symbolic. Let's go to the book of Daniel. And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceedingly great, toward the south, toward the east, and toward the pleasant land. And it waxed great, even to the host of heaven. And it cast down some of the hosts of the stars to the ground, and stamped upon them. Yea, he magnified himself, even to the prince of the host. And by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of the sanctuary was cast down. In these verses, it was Antiochus Epiphanes who overthrew the ruling authorities in the Near East after the death of Alexander the Great in 323 B.C. Antiochus Epiphanes was a dreadful character. He organized an expedition against Jerusalem, which he destroyed. He most cruelly put many of its inhabitants to death. His soldiers went into the Jewish temple and slaughtered a pig on the altar of the Lord. They set the pig ablaze and took the meat and tried to make the Jewish men eat it. The men refused, and he cut out their tongues, scalped them, cut off their hands and feet, and burned them on the altar. So we've established once again the symbolism of the sun, moon, and stars as rulers and governing powers. And mountains, islands, and rocks represent prophetical kingdoms and peoples. With this being established, it is no doubt the Christian martyrs must have testified to their persecutors. They must have warned the pagan Romans of the wrath of God and the day of vengeance that would surely come upon them unless they repent and stop the persecutions. We can imagine how these pagans must have shrugged off these warnings and laughed and snickered as they lit the Christians ablaze and drove spikes through their hands. They must have laughed in their drunken state in the security of the Colosseum Gallery as the beasts ravaged and tore the Christians apart limb from limb. But now their political heavens began to crumble apart, something I'm sure they thought would never happen. The pagans remembered the warnings, and also the courage and supernatural boldness in which these martyrs had faced death. All men without God are superstitious and fear death. With the memories of all the warnings and anguishing Christians swearing God's revenge, it must have been panic stations as their world began to collapse around them. It was the kings, great men, mighty men, who hid themselves in dens and in the rocks. Hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. These superstitious pagans dug up the bones and relics of the martyrs and started to venerate and worship them. They called them Saint So-and-So and and tried to invoke their protection. The tumbling down of the heavens of pagan Rome happened this way. 
the Roman emperor Diocletian, together with his rulers whom he had appointed in the government of the empire, persecuted the Christians mercilessly, and vowed to kill them all and extinguish the name of Christianity. The people of Italy, crushed beneath the tyranny and misrule, sought out Constantine, who had become the emperor of the eastern half of the Roman Empire. They pleaded with him to deliver them. Now Constantine's mother was a Christian, Lady Helen of York. Constantine must have heard the gospel message from his mother and others as well. Constantine accepted their request, and with his army he marched towards Rome. At the famous battle of Milvian Bridge, Constantine defeated Diocletian's army in 312 A.D. The very next year he issued the Edict of Milan, which gave liberty to the Christians. The pagan Roman persecutions were finally over, with ten million martyrs slain. What happened to Diocletian and his associates? They were terrified, just as the sixth seal tells us. Diocletian was so panic-stricken he died insane. Maximilian committed suicide. Galerius was tormented by agonizing remorse and died a horrible disease. Constantine became a great emperor, and Rome had a wonderful opportunity to repent. However, this she failed to do, and in the year 476 A.D., we will see the eventual and complete disruption of the Roman Empire. The disintegration started when the Roman Empire was split into two opposing halves in 395 A.D., the western half becoming ruled by the Emperor Honorius, and the eastern half governed by Emperor Arcadius. Thus we see the ending of the sixth seal and the great earthquake breaking the empire in half. But it was not taken from the scene of history. The final disappearing act will come as the book of Revelation continues to unfold.